Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's start all over. Good morning. Uh, great to see each and every one of you here today. Hope you had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. And again, for those of you that are visiting with us, we certainly uh, welcome you to Webb Chapel this morning. I uh, pray that you come and be with us the next time that you can. Now, if you visit from another church, we don't want to take you away, but uh, please come and join us when you can. In regards to announcements, uh, if you take your bulletin, uh, we see that this afternoon, uh, Rod Propes will be here in concert with us. I know many of you remember Rod being with us earlier, so I uh, trust that you'll come back and join uh, with us at 7 for our evening worship. Also this afternoon from 2 to 3, uh, please come out uh, for Mr. Douglas and Ms. Eula as they will be leaving and going to uh, Maryland. We want to send them off in a, in a very good way, so uh, we look forward to seeing you from 2 to 3. Uh, to, to extend your well wishes to both of them. <clears throat> also, you see in our, our, your bulletin that Thursday, deacons, you will be meeting at 7 o'clock. I'd also like to say to pass the search committee, if uh, we could meet for just a couple of minutes uh, down in the last Sunday school room on the right as you head over toward uh, uh, Miss Rachel. So uh, two, three minutes past the search committee. Okay, uh, <clears throat> other announcements that you see in your bulletin. Uh, teenagers will be meeting not leaving the church not this coming Tuesday. I do believe the uh, next Tuesday, which will be uh, December the 8th, for a trip. So uh, teenagers, don't forget that. Uh, also, you want to make plans to be here at church uh, Sunday evening, December the 6th, uh, as uh, we will be showing a movie, The Value of a Soul. Uh, you don't want to miss that. On the back of your bulletin, you see the announcement in regards to uh, a new frame display in the fellowship hall. If you have a plaque that maybe uh, you have received or a uh, member of your family in the past has received a, a plaque and you would like it placed here in the church, uh, if you'll see uh, Ms. Doris or Ms. Charlotte, they will take care of that need for you. Uh, women on Mission would like to also invite you to their foreign missions breakfast on Saturday, December the 12th at 8.30. Uh, Ms. Pats will be presenting the program, and a sign-up sheet is located uh, right down here in front of us, so please don't forget that. A vote will be uh, taken on a proposed budget for this upcoming year on December the 13th. A copy of that budget uh, should have been included uh, with your most recent newsletter, so please, uh, as you come to church on the 13th, knowing that uh, Sunday evening we'll be going to church conference voting on that. And uh, also, uh, these two announcements, one runs into another, one ceases and one begins. I do believe that this is the last day to receive offering for the uh, North Carolina Baptist Children's Home. Uh, so with that being the last day for North Carolina Baptist Children's Homes, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, certainly begins. So uh, two wonderful, wonderful uh, offerings that uh, if you're Baptist, you already know all about. We just pray that you would give as the Lord has laid on your heart. And if we do that, then everything will be well. Again, welcome to Webb's Chapel this morning. Uh, birthdays, anniversaries. Anyone celebrating a birthday or an anniversary? Okay, let's let's do it this way. Any other announcements?
Let's continue our worship by getting a hymn book and turning to page four. To God be the glory. Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> be seated. <clears throat> As we come to our time of prayer, I would certainly call your attention to those names that are listed in our bulletin. Uh, those names that are printed are Ralph Spain, Brenda Seymour, Linda Baker, Polly Gooding, Ms. Evelyn Burdett, Ms. Mary Baker, Faye Allen, Wendell Burton, Ms. Mary Frances Gray, Wayne Murphy, Sarah K. Pollard, D. Phillips, Ms. Maggie Lewis, Ms. Susan Owens, Mr. R.B. Owens, Jennifer Harrell. Do you have others that we need to include on our prayer list today? Okay. 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 Any others? Okay. Brad, will you lead us in our prayer this morning? Let's get our hymn books once again and turn to page 43. This is my father's world. Let's stand as we sing.
Amen. Long with Brother Ralph, we appreciate each one of you being here today. We've just got a short little film clip here that we want to show to you. Dr. Robert Jeffries is pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Right after the attack in Paris, he made a statement to his church about the Muslim religion. A lot of times we are so politically correct in America that we can't tell the truth anymore about something. I want you to listen to this and see what he says about Muslims. It's a short little clip, so you just pay attention to it. Before I begin this morning, I feel like I need to address the tragedy we all witnessed this weekend in Paris. What should be our response to that tragedy? Certainly as Christians, we should be praying for the victims and the victims' families. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted. But I believe that as Christians, we need to do more than simply pray. I believe it is time for us to lay aside political correctness and identify the belief system that is responsible for these horrific acts and that is the evil, evil religion of radical Islam. That is the belief system that inspired this tragedy. And make no mistake about it, Islam is just not another way to approach God. Islam is a false religion, and it is inspired by Satan himself, who Jesus said came to steal, kill, and destroy. And this weekend, we saw the fruit of Satan's destruction in the acts of these terrorists. It is impossible to separate what these eight suicide bombers did from their faith, their religion that inspired them to do this. These terrorists were not acting in opposition to the teaching of Islam. They were acting according to the teaching of Islam. And let me illustrate that for you. Compare Islam to Christianity. As Christians, we follow the Bible. We follow the New Testament specifically. You cannot find a verse anywhere in the New Testament that commands us to kill unbelievers. But the Quran, the book of Muslims is laced with verse after verse that says, kill the infidels. That's people like you and me. Over and over again, 35 different sword verses in the Quran commanding violence. Jesus is the founder of our faith. He is known as the Prince of Peace. He didn't kill anyone. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, was a prince of war. He slaughtered thousands. At one time alone, he beheaded 600 Jews who wouldn't follow him into battle. Jesus, the founder of our faith, said, love your enemies. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, said, 
kill your enemies, amputate their limbs. The reason I am bringing this up is, ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely impossible to defeat an enemy you are unwilling to identify. And that's why... So what is to be our response as Christians to this massacre in Paris? There's a lot of confusion among Christians on this topic because many Christians confuse their individual responsibilities as Christians and, and with government's responsibility as a government. As individual Christians, we are called upon to love, to forgive, to pray, to share the gospel. That is our individual responsibility. But government has a different God-given responsibility. Government is never called upon to forgive. Government is never called upon to turn the other cheek. The responsibility of government, according to the Word of God, is to protect its citizens. And one reason and one way that government protects its citizens is by securing the borders. It is government's responsibilities to secure the borders. And let's just go ahead and say this and make it clear. Having secure borders is not anti-Christian, as some people would lead you to believe. Did you know that borders are God's idea? God doesn't mean for us to live all as one people and one nation, all under uh, the same auspice and without any borders around the world. That is not God's plan. Acts 17.26 says, It is God himself who established the boundaries, the borders in which people should live. That was God's idea. And it's government's responsibility to secure our border in order to protect us. Not only that, it is government's responsibility to punish evildoers. Romans 13 says, God has empowered the government, the military, to bring wrath against those who practice evil. You may not agree with everything that Donald Trump says, but Donald Trump was absolutely correct Thursday night when he said, it is time to start bombing the you-know-what out of ISIS. That is a biblical response. Now, I want to say this. I want to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do not confront and defeat the evil of radical Islam, the evil of radical Islam is going to confront and defeat us. It is time for our government to step up and do whatever is necessary militarily to rid this world of the cancer called radical Islam. It is time for us to act. Amen. I hope and pray that you realize a lot of times you can't. Amen. Yeah. You just can't listen to a lot you hear on TV or a lot you hear in the world reading the papers. You need to know the truth. And the Bible says the truth will set us free. So good to have each one of you today. I uh, appreciate you being here. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to Acts number 10. Acts number 10, if, you, if you're turning, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have, uh, I've got two of my biological cousins here today. So we just thank God for that. You need them at the church. Don't tell them nothing about me. Just talk to them about them, okay? We're so glad to have them and have their friends with them today also. All right, Acts chapter 10. You remember that we've been talking to you in the last few weeks about Acts, and we talked to you about Saul being saved and how God changed, radically changed his life. We talked to you about Philip, how that after uh, Stephen was stoned to death, he went down to Samaria, and God just caused a revival to take place there. And after that, that he was in that revival, God told him to go over to Gaza, and he met the Ethiopian eunuch over there, and how he, how he discipled him right quickly so to speak, and that Ethiopian unit prayed to receive Christ, and he was baptized, and he went on back to his country rejoicing. 
The Bible says that. And then the Bible talked about what we talked about last week, about how that uh, Peter passed through and he came to a place and he saw a certain man named Aeneas there and he talked with him and God worked in his life. So in the book of Acts, you'll see how God's working with individuals. But today is a, a unique day in that God, not only in his, in his sovereignty, reached the Jewish nation and reached the ones around about them, but God in his sovereignty now extends his love and his mercy over to the Gentiles. And that's how you and I got into the body of Christ. Thank God for that. So as you stand, if you would, as we honor the reading of God's inspired, infallible, and errant word in chapter 10 of Acts, we'll read about uh, a fellow named uh, Cornelius. Look, look at what the Bible says here. Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 1. And there was a certain man in Caesarea, at Caesarea called uh, Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And listen, listen to how the Bible describes him now. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and uh, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he lodged with one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel had spoken unto Cornelius had, was departed, he called two of his household servants, a devout uh, soldier, uh, and a devout soldier that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on tomorrow, uh, uh, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up on the, ha uh, the rooftop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while he made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners and let down to the earth, wherein there were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, say uh, to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for, it is, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake to him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, let that call thou not common. And this was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Let me read verse 17, and we'll quit. Listen to this. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made uh, inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much now for being so good and gracious to us. Thank you for the choir and for the inspiring words, Lord, and song. this morning, Lord. Thank you for all that's taken place in this service thus far. But God, I pray today that you would reach down in a mighty way. Lord, we know that you're here. You tell us in your word that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, you've already here when we came today. You came with us, and thank you for that. But Lord, I pray now that you would be glorified in what we do, how we respond to you. The word that we just read, Lord, is the powerful word of God. The Bible says it's without error. And Lord, I pray today that you would take the word of God and take that soul that's nearest to eternity without you and help them to see that they need you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you'll work in church members' hearts today. Lord, there's probably people in this building today, and I know across our land today, that are members of a church, but they're not members of the body of Christ. God, I pray today that you'd work. Lord, I want to be a different person when I leave than what I was when I came. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and lives and draw us close to you. Help us to do what we need to do to be right with you when we stand before you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much.
and you may be seated. Think about this. And it, I mean, this is a powerful verse of Scripture. It talks about Cornelius, a, a centurion. He was a Gentile. And look how, how, how it describes him. He was one that, that, that feared God with all of his house. He was one that gave alms. He was a generous person. He was one that prayed to God always. Man, if we had people in our churches like that, we'd say, glory, hallelujah. We've got people here that are walking with God, people that are fellowshipping with God. But the Bible says that this man did not know God. And he said, I want you to go, and, and if you look over there in chapter 11, you'll see that, uh, that where God told him, said, you go and get Peter, and Peter's going to tell you and your household how to be saved. Man, all the, all the credentials that he had, all the uh, uh, attributes that he had, that you and I would say, this man's bound to be right with God. And yet still, the Spirit of God said, no, he's not. He's just going through the motions. Now, you can relate that to, to people in the church. I mean, I've told you myself that I was, I was baptized when I was 12, but I want a bit more saved than that candle is saved. There wasn't any change that took place in my life. And I'm asking you today, to, to, to evaluate your life and see, listen, it, has anything radical changed in my life? Do I think the same way I used to think? Do I think the same way the world thinks? Do I behave the same way the world does? Cornelius was a man that, so, that you and I would say that walked with God, so to speak, and yet still God, the Bible says that whenever he saw that vision, that angel came to him, he said, you, you go get Peter, and Peter will tell you what to do. So think about this. This man was, had all the, all the uh, attributes that you and I would say was a good fellow. I mean, a good fellow. He, he just bound to know the Lord. And I've seen them throughout the church, the churches that we've been in, that they, 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 uh, had, they, they knew the vocabulary. They knew the words to say. They could pray a prayer, but their life did not reflect that they knew Jesus Christ. And so I'm asking you today to make sure that you are right with God. Don't worry about your, your maid or don't worry about the one in front of you, the one beside of you. Worry about and be concerned about yourself. The Bible says that, that Cornelius, look, look, look what it says here in verse 9. Well, not, let me back up to verse 7. And when the angel which spoke unto Cornelius was departing, what did he do? He, 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 told Peter, he told Cornelius, he said, I want, you to, I want you to go. All these things that you're doing, they're coming up for memorial before God. He said, I want you to know that I, I've, I've taken notice. God said, I've taken notice of how sincere you are, how devoted you are, how concerned you are, how you want to be right with me. I believe when you and I, when God in his mercy and in his grace that, that realizes that you and I really want to be right with him, he'll do whatever it takes to get us right with him. And so the Bible says he sent an angel to Cornelius about the ninth hour. Notice this. This is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Their, their, their day started at 6 o'clock. So it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the Bible says that that angel told him, by the way, that's the same time that Jesus died, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so the Bible says that that angel appeared to him and said, listen, these, these things that you've been doing, they, there's a memorial come up to you. See, a memorial, let me, let me read to you a little definition of memorial. That which keeps alive the memory of someone or something. Is, a, is just a good little definition. That's what we did on Wednesday night. That's what we did with the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. What does it do? The Bible says, as often as you do this, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, it, it's something that causes us to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. And by the way, as you know, this is the first time, or Wednesday night was the first time, that I'd ever been in a silent anything in a Baptist church. I had never been in a silent, nothing, in a Baptist church. But it was a silent communion, and I mean it was so impressive. And Mark, you did a tremendous job with those pictures and getting those things right. I mean, it just, just worked out well. I thought it was just wonderful. And I was scared to start with. Sharon said that she won't never be able to stay silent all that long. But she was. She didn't have to have any tape or nothing, you know, that night. So, but what I'm saying is, Cornelius had done so much that the angel said, those things that you've been doing, look in verse 4. Thy prayers and thine arms will come up for a memorial before God. Man, you've been dedicated. This is not something, a fly-by-night thing. You've been dedicated. You've been doing something and got God's attention. 
And so the Bible says that the angel told him, he said, you send forth to Joppa. You send forth to Joppa, and you find Peter. And he told him exactly where he was. And by the way, he said that Peter was down at Simon the Tanner's house. One time when Sharon and I went to Israel, we went to a house that they said was Simon the Tanner's house. I don't know where it was or not, but it was by the seashore. By virtue of Peter being there where those dead animals were was amazing. A Jew would never do that. Prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, a Jew would never have done that. But Peter was there with Simon the Tanner. And the Bible says, listen, listen how God is working. Uh, Cornelius was at, in Caesarea, and Peter was in Joppa. And the Bible says that about the twelfth hour, about the hour that the, uh, about six o'clock, uh, excuse me, twelve o'clock in the daytime, the Bible says that Peter went up on the roof to pray while others got ready to meal. Now, Peter went up there, and God in his mercy, he had already worked in Cornelius' life. He had already had those men coming. They were almost ready to knock on the door of Simon the Tanner's house. And the Bible says that Peter was in a trance. And the Bible says that, that a great sheet came down. And notice how it describes these things. He said, all four-footed animals, four-footed animals was in that sheet. sheet. And all the, listen, look, look, look at verse 12. Wherein there were uh, all manner of four-footed beasts. I guarantee there was a hog in there or a pig. And a Jew can't stand a pig. We've been to Israel many times. I've never seen a hog farm in Israel. I've never seen one. It might be some, but I had never seen them. Four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things. Creeping things. Think about that. Dr. Einside, I was reading behind him the other day, and he said that his daddy on his deathbed was saying, and he was quoting some of that verse. And he got to the creeping things, and he couldn't remember exactly what that said. And someone reminded him, the creeping things. And Dr. Ironside's daddy said, yes, that's how I got in. A creeping thing. Think about that. You and I don't have anything to offer God. You and I don't have anything that, that God desires, that God needs. Man, it's just by his mercy and by his grace that he loved us and he saved us. And so the Bible says that all those creeping things and all those full-footed animals were there. And the Bible says that it came down to earth, and a voice came to him. Listen to this. Now, you need to know this. A voice came to him uh, in verse 13. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, Peter, I want you to get up. You, you're hungry. Man, you can smell those sardines or whatever they're cooking down there. You, you just smell them. And, and you know that you're hungry. And so I want you to rise. I want you to kill something that's in this sheet and eat it. And look what Peter said. Peter said in verse 14, And Peter said, Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that's common nor unclean. Peter said, You're bound to have the wrong person. I've never eaten anything that's in this sheet at all. I've never eaten. And he said a statement, Not so, Lord. And you and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's the oxymoron. You can't call Jesus Lord and then say not so. I want you to get that now. I tried that for years. God was working in my life calling me to preach, and I said, not so, Lord. I want to serve you in other ways. I want to win folks to you. I want to bring children to church. I want to do all those things. I want to join everything I can join. But, Lord, I don't want to preach. Preach is not in my vocabulary. And so if I would say not so, Lord. But I want you to know today, you can say not so, but you can't say not so, Lord. You can say, Lord, I hope and pray that's what we say today. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be what you want me to be. I want you to go where you want me to go. Don't say not so. When you say not so, that is automatically disobeying a commandment. Not so. You and I can't do that. Someone has very well said that Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Make up your mind today. Is he Lord of your life? And the Bible says that he, he was talking to Peter and using that trance that he was in to let him see that, look, whatever God is called, don't you call anything common or unclean. Look at verse 15. And the voice spake unto him again is the second time, what God had cleansed, don't you call uh, that, that uh, what God had cleansed, that calleth not thou common. In other words, don't you say that some nationality is better than the others. Don't you say that? 
He said, don't you say that anything that I have cleansed is common or clean. God said, I made them. I made them. I know what it takes. I know what they are. And I know good and well it's not what goes into the body that defiles a person. It's what's in that person. It's what's in their, their mind, their being is, is what he's saying. And so he said, don't you call anything that I have cleansed common or unclean. We as Southern Baptists sometimes, we as Southerners sometimes can do the same thing. We can be prejudiced and uh, show prejudices against certain people, certain, certain colors, certain uh, where people came from, wherever it might be. We can be prejudiced about that. And the Bible says that ought not to be. You and I ought to realize that God made everyone. He made, uh, he, he made every human being. Doesn't make any difference. Red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight. I won't never forget when we, went to, when we went to Haiti one time. Well, it's the only time I've been to Haiti. We went to Haiti and, and, and uh, we built a church, trying to build a church over there. And those uh, cement block that they had was real poor. I mean, they, they had a lot of, lot of uh, gravel in them, a lot of sand in them, but not much concrete. And honest to goodness, you could take those things. You know how they got three holes in them? You could take those things and pick them up. And if you didn't pick them up just right, that concrete would crumble in your hand before you got it up where it's supposed to be. That's how, how sorry they were. You realize whenever they have earthquakes or whatever over in that area or, or hurricanes or whatever it might be, that construction is so flimsy that no one is so much destruction over there. But one of the things that I enjoyed doing while I was there was when I could get caught up. I was the mud man. I, I would take the wheelbarrow and push around the mud to different places in the in the building. So when I could catch up, I'd get those little children, and they, they, they really wanted to learn the English language. And so I'd get them out there and say, God loves the little children, red and yellow. I'd say yellow, red and yellow, black and white. And I had them saying yellow. They'd say yellow, red and yellow, black and white. You know, God loves those little children. Doesn't make any difference what color they are, what color they are, where they came from. God, what God has cleansed, called thou not common or unclean. And the Bible says that... Um, this happened three times. This happened three times. And Peter had said the same thing evidently three times. And the Bible says that, 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 that God got his attention. Look, look at verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, he was perplexed. He didn't know what it meant. He didn't understand it. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate. Think about it. There were three men there. There were, there were a one soldier and two servants that he had sent. And three times that sheet came down. Three times. Do you think Peter equated that to three times? Three men came. And if you're going to read, the Bible says that he told him, he said, don't you worry about it, Peter. You go on. I've sent them. You go with them. You go with them. And the Bible says that he went on to Cornelius' house. So ask yourself today, listen, has there anything ever happened to me I think about it. Cornelius could be related to, in a sense, to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Jew, of course, but the Bible says he came to Jesus by night and said, we realize that you are a man come from God because no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with you. You can't just do that by yourself. God's with you. I realize that. And I believe that Nicodemus was thinking and, asking and, and th expecting Jesus to just pat him on the back and say, Nicodemus, you got it. You're together. You go on. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, even though you know that, even though you know I came from God, even though you realize there's a God, even though you realize that and believe in the miracles that I do, he said, I want you to know, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Not only that, he said the second time, he said, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's no way. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the same way today. Same way today. It doesn't make any difference how long we've been a member of a church or how long we've been attending church. That, that, that's not, Jesus is not going to ask you that. He's not going to ask you how much you have given to, to Webb's Chapel Baptist Church or whatever other church you might be a member of. He's going to say, what have you done with Jesus Christ? What have you done? Is Jesus Christ changed your life? Is Jesus Christ in you? Do you have a new nature? Or old things passed away, behold, all things become new. That's what God is going to hold us accountable for. And that's what he's saying here to Cornelius. He said, I want you to know, look what, Jesus, look what God did to get Peter ready to do his will. Man, if those people had been a day earlier, 
and knocked on that door, Peter would, Peter would not even probably talk to them because they were Gentiles. He would not have anything to do with them. But man, when God got a hold of him, ask yourself, God, what have you got to do in me? What have you got allowed to allow in my life to get me so that I'll be usable? I want to be usable. Lord, what have you got to do? What are you going to allow to take place in my life so that I'll be obedient to you, so that you will really be Lord of my life? Not, not that I just say you're Lord, but Lord, you will really be Lord. What have you got to do? What did he have to do to Peter? Then he showed him a vision. You say, well, Brother Billy, if God would show me a vision, if I just see a vision, I'd be, I'd be ready. I'd be willing. I'd be Johnny on the spot, so to speak. Well, let me tell you something. God has given us his word. Man, and all you and I need to do is read his word. Man, this is God's love letter to you and God's love letter to me. And he, he, he died on the cross. Listen, they, they, did, they, just, they, just, they were just realizing what Jesus Christ had done. That, that Peter had seen the risen Lord. Man, he was not about to, to, to do anything that would cause reproach. He'd already denied him, as I said last week. He'd already denied him three times. But now... God, in his mercy and in his grace, allowed that sheep to come down with all those animals in him. And Peter said, listen, I know God has done this for a reason. I know God is allowing this for a reason. Lord, what, what, what you, I, I, in verse 17, he said he was perplexed. He, he didn't know, he didn't understand it. And yet still God was working. He works on both ends. He was working in Cornelius' life in order for him to send the soldier and the servants there. He was working in Peter's life. But he had to get Peter ready. He had to get Peter. It could be, listen to me real good, it could be that what you're going through right now or what you went through last week or what you're going to go through next week is preparing you for God to use you in a way that you would never even imagine how he could use you. I'm telling you, God does not waste difficult times in our life. God does not waste those times. God uses those times to draw us close to him and help us to realize who we are. You say, Brother Billy, I'm not sure that I agree with you that Cornelius was lost. He, he called, he, he, he just did a lot of good things. He, he called that angel Lord and he was talking to him and he, 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 he given so much and he applied himself and he, he was a man well thought of. Well, the Bible says here again that he said over there in chapter 11, said, you go get Peter and he'll tell you how to be saved. Listen, John Wesley, I know many of you, most of you all probably have heard of John Wesley. Let me, let me read to you just a little bit about what I found about John Wesley. John Wesley was like Cornelius in a sense. He was, he was a religious man. Listen to this. He was a church member. He was a minister. He was a minister. He was a son of a minister. He belonged to a religious club in Oxford, and the purpose of that club was uh, perfecting the Christian life. In other words, how can I get closer to God? In other words, he was being discipled even then. Re Wesley served as a foreign missionary. He was even, as he, uh, as he preached to others, and had no assurance of his salvation. No assurance at all. He was doing all the outside things that you and I could, would think that God would honor that you and I would think that were motivated, motivated by a relationship with him. But the Bible says that, uh, that he, was, he, was, he didn't have an assurance of his salvation. Listen, on May the 24th, 1738, Wesley reluctantly, reluctantly attended a small meeting in London where somebody was reading from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. The Romans is a book that tells us how we're to live, how God transforms our life and how, the, how that God does that. About, uh, listen to this, about a quarter before nine, 15 to nine, Wesley wrote in his journal while he was describing, while the man was, that was uh, reading the journal was describing the change which God works in the hearts of, of, of people through faith in Jesus Christ. This is what Wesley said. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. Man, what are you and I relating to? What are you and I relying on for our salvation? Are we relying on our good works? Wesley could say, yes, sir, I, good works is what I've got. I'm, I'm a minister. I know the word. I'm preaching to people. I'm a foreign missionary. Listen to this. He said, 
I felt, listen, I felt strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And, and, and assurance was given me that he, was ta- that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The results was, the results was the great Westland revival that uh, not only swept many into the kingdom, but also helped transform Brit- British society through the Christian uh, uh, societal actions. In other words, when Wesley really got saved, when he really had the assurance of his salvation, God transformed not only him, but the people that were around about him, the people in the region. There was a revival that took place. I'm telling you today, if, if, if America ever needed a revival, it's today. We can blame it on the, on the politicians. We can blame it on ISIS. We can blame it on whatever we want to. But the Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, and turn from their wicked ways, what did the Bible say? I will, open, I, will, I will transform them. I will open the windows of heaven, and I'll pour out blessings upon them. In other words, I'll change this world is what he's saying. You and I, you and I, through Jesus Christ being in us, has the transforming power to make, to make a change, radical changes take place in, our, in us, in our homes, and in our communities around about us. Ask yourself today. Ask yourself today. Lord, ha, am I, do I really know you? Was there ever a time, was there ever a place that I really bowed on my knee before God and ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins, ask him to come into my heart and change my life. If not, if not, chances are you're just going through the motions. And my heart bleeds for people that do that. They, 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 a lot of people don't come and, and tell people and get right with God because of pride. They say, what are people going to say? Man, I've been a member of this church. I've been a deacon. I've been a preacher. I've been a Sunday school teacher, whatever it is. What are they going to think when I come up here and just get saved? Man, I know what they'll think. If they really know the Lord, they'll rejoice with you. Man, I'd rather, I'd rather for them to come to you and think I was a total nut than I had to die and go to hell. Think about that. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Every head bow, every eye closed. Think about it today. What is our relationship with Jesus Christ? Is there anything that I can do to help you, give you the assurance of your salvation? You say, Brother Billy, I went through the motion, but I don't know. I, I have, I doubt my salvation. I doubt. I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I think I would, but I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. I'm telling you, if you're in that condition today, I would pray today that you would make, you can make that right, right now. You can say this little simple prayer. And, it, and it's not the, not the words in the prayer, but it's the motive and the intent of the heart. Say, God, I'm a sinner. And I realize that Jesus Christ loved me and died for my sins. And Lord, I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to come into my heart and in my life and radically change me. Give me the assurance of my salvation. I want to know that I know that if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I want to know that. Lord, give me the assurance of my salvation. And Lord, I'll live for you. I'll live for you until you take me home. Oh, listen, if you prayed that prayer today, I hope and pray you'll come. Because it's probably some people, other people here, that have just prayed that simple prayer and really meant it from the heart. And God changed them. God gave them the assurance of their salvation. I want you to know that. You know other things. You know that. So you can know about your salvation. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that you may know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life. Father, you know what take, needs to take place in this offering, in this invitational hymn. Now, Lord, I pray today that you would be glorified. I pray that every one of us, Lord, would respond in a way to bring glory and honor to your name. In the way that we wish we'd have done if we had to stand before you before this day is over. Help us to do that, and we'll love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. What's our hymn, brother? Breathe on me, page 238. Let's all stand and just sing it out. If we can help you in any way, maybe you're here and you say, Brother Billy, I know I'm not saved. You come. We take the Bible and show you not what the Baptists say you've got to do to be saved, but what the Bible says you've got to do to be saved. Let us do that. Let us help you in any way we can, okay?
said, I'm sure he's good if you ought to have him back. He's already been here. If he was a dud, you wouldn't have had him back. But he's not a dud, so you come hear him tonight. Also, next Sunday night is the film, Billy Graham, Billy Graham for his birthday. Really, we supposed to have done it in, in November, but things worked out, so we couldn't do it. So the 6th, on the 6th, on Sunday night, is gives you three testimonies of people that God radically changed. Now, I would urge you to bring you lost friends. Bring people that don't go to church anywhere. Just bring them. Oh, it's just going to be a good time, good time for how God uses and how God can radically change somebody. Every one of us in here that are Christians can, can give that testimony. God radically changed me, and I know he has you also. May God bless you. Thank you so much for coming, and may God bless you and give you a good afternoon. Brother Aubrey, how about dismiss us, if you would, with a word of prayer?